All right, this is chapter one for Principles of Information Security, the fifth edition. Okay. All right, these are some of the objectives we're going to cover. You can uh, read through them if you like, but pretty much it's everything in this chapter. Okay. Information security, like it says here, is an all-informed sense of assurance that information risk and controls are in balance. Um, so basically, what does that mean? That means taking our information system and making it secure. It's the risks like the viruses. It's the controls like our virus software. It's the risks like an intruder. It's our controls like our firewalls, all working together. Okay. Now, it says on here, the professionals must review the origins of this field to understand where they came. In other words, it's what's the saying? If you don't know history, you're bound to repeat history, whatever that system is. But what that means is you need to keep updated on the security of today. Okay. History, it's been around for a long time. Um, I teach other classes like cryptography, where we talk about all the different uh, ways of encrypting things all the way back to the Caesar cipher. There's a new movie out called um, Imitation Game about Alan Turing and how he cracked the Enigma machine back in World War II. So just lots of different issues you know, in computer security. I mean, there's, there's threats today, new threats coming out today. So... History of it, it's been in for a long time. We have physical controls, we have software controls, we have hardware controls. Physical controls, it says limiting access to sensitive military locations. I mean, think, Tinker Air Force Base is across the street from us. They have fences, they have gates, they have guards. Those would be physical controls, okay? And it says, you know, these are rudimentary in defense against physical theft. Yeah, if we have a door with a lock on it, obviously that's there to protect something. If the door is left open, obviously something can get stolen. Okay. Uh, here we have a chart of a lot of the different things. We're not going to go over all of them, but you know, look through them at your leisure. It is in your text. You'll see just a lot of things is happening. There's actually a, a good book called Crypto by Stephen Levy, who talks pretty much about how cryptography came into play. There's a lot of good books out there um, by Kevin Mitnick, Art of Intrusion, Art of Detection, Ghost in the wires, just all kinds of different books. There's tons of them out there about all these different topics. Uh, in 1979, you see something there called the Association of Computing Machinery. That's probably one of those popular places to read articles on computers and anything to do with technology. Okay, here we have our Enigma machine again. Uh, the movie, um, whatever it's called, The Imitation Game, talked about breaking the Enigma machine. Breaking you know, the, the the Germans were using it to encrypt messages and no one could do anything with it because it's based on settings. They needed to know what to set those keys to. So if you get a chance to go watch that movie, it's actually very interesting. So some ask why, if we're reading the Enigma, why did we win, not to win earlier, read the, or watch the movie, you'll learn why. Okay? Way back when, we came up with something called ARPANET. No, this was not invented by Al Gore was originally made to connect military networks together. Okay? After that point, they brought on schools, educational institutions. Then from that point on, it became um, you know, commercial where everybody got on it. Okay? Here's one of the original plans. Uh, I actually had a video of the, uh, or not a video, a picture of the original diagram made. It showed a four-hubbed circle. So. Kind of cool, ARPANET way back in 68, which is the precursor to our today's internet. Okay. 70s and 80s grew and became very popular. And I'm trying to think, what was I doing in 1970? Let's see, I was eight years old, so not a darn thing. 1980s, I joined the military. I was a jet engine mechanic, and I really don't remember anything about the internet in 1980. But it started to grow. We had dial-up connections initially. I remember a 2400 baud modem. It was ungodly slow, and now today when we complain, we only have a 150 megabit connection, okay? So, and back then, like it says on the last bullet there, non-existent user identification authorization. There was nothing. There was no usernames and passwords way back when. <laughs> Sorry if you hear a dog barking in the background. That's my dog. I'm recording this at home. Okay, 70s and 80s. We had the RAND report. It was one of the first about computer security and about the management and the policies. Now can we start keeping track of all this stuff, okay? Uh, talked about securing your data, 
It says limiting random and unauthorized access. Again, way back initially you saw back on this slide, we didn't have any authorization on systems. So they were saying, you know what, it's a bad idea to just let everybody in there. Okay. All right, here we have our, you know, just talking about some of the different vulnerabilities. We have, you know, our process. We have our switching center. We have, you know, I'm, look at the maintenance man in the middle. He's, you know, think of it, you know, he's something that, how can I say it, that uh, basically tracks our network, keeps track of what's going on. It. How about our user over on the right? That's our user system where people are going to have to log into our network. Just all kinds of different ways. Taps on wires, cross like I remember back in um, probably early 90s buying a scanner. We used to drive by houses on Tinker Air Force Base and listen in on people's phone calls just for fun. Okay? How about on the left? Files, copying files, unauthorized access to files, just all kinds of different issues or vulnerabilities that can happen. Okay? Multics, um, multi, I can't, can't talk. Multiplex information and computing services. It was a way starting to speed up our computer environment. Allow it really was popular with Unix. Like it says there, it says it was created by Unix. Give us our multiprocessor system. Allowed multiple people to log in. So it, we started to get to the point to use computers more in depth. Okay. 1990s, we come out with networks. Now all of a sudden, we're starting to connect things together. We're starting to share data. We have the internet. It says the first global network. Okay, it says uh, the, the fourth bullet's great. In early independent deployment, security was treated as a low priority. No one cared initially. 1993, DEF CON was established, and look where it is today. It's a very popular um, thing in Vegas. Okay. 2000s. Now, you know, we have you know, the internet, like I said, bringing millions of unsecured computer networks into continuous communications. Every person that connects to the internet is now part of it. So, you know, even your mother, your grandparents, your next door neighbor who know nothing about security are connected to the internet. They're probably the next person to get a virus. It says the ability to secure a computer's data was, influ was influenced by the security of every computer which is connected to. Okay? So if you connect something to my computer and I have a virus, the odds are I'm going to transfer it to you. Okay? More cyber attacks. We hear about them every single day on the news. Now, what is security? Uh, this is a great quote. The state of being secure and free from danger or harm. The action taken to make someone or something secure. Is that possible? It is not. There is no... You cannot make something secure. The only way you're going to make, like this laptop I'm here recording on, is unplug it, disconnect it, power off, put it in a bag, put it in a watertight container, in a safe, and never turn it on. Because you're never going to be safe otherwise. Okay. All right, different layers of security. Operational security, physical infrastructure, our people, our functions, our communications, our information. So our information is like our data. I think we actually talked about these in other slides. But how about the people? How many people do you know that use computers that don't really know what they're doing? That might be some of you listening to this. Okay. So the protection of information is critical. So while we work at a school, we have grades. Is that important? Uh, yeah, very important. Okay. They start talking here at the bottom about the CIA, the, the triangle, the confidentiality, and the integrity and avail availability. We will talk about each one. But that is very important, and it is covered in virtually every class, so you do need to know it. Okay. Here we have, on the right-hand side of our triangle, we have confidentiality. And I think we actually, yeah, we do we do it to more in depth. But, you know, confidentiality, who has the ability to change it? Okay. Integrity, has the data been altered, you know, without access? Okay. Availability, you know, everything's based on the Internet. Now, what happens if the Internet goes down? Can you continue to do your job? And all that surrounds data and services. So think about our data. What happens if we have no integrity of our data? What if my grades were just modified? What if, you know, our data wasn't available? What if you went to enroll and the schedule was offline? Okay. Looking at the picture on the left, you know, we have computer security, data security, never sure. Policies. Okay. That's a big deal. Do you have a usage policy? Do you have a 
a password policy? Do you have a backup policy? Do you have all that stuff? That's all aspects of it. Okay. Here's some of the different concepts. Access, asset, you know, access. Do I have access to the system? Obviously, right now I have access to this laptop. An asset, what am I protecting? Is that my physical laptop or is it the data? The attack could be someone trying to break into it. You know, exploit, someone trying to break into it. How about loss? Someone, you know, I lost my data. You know, we suffered a loss because of a cyber attack or because of a, you know, a natural disaster. How about risk? What are some of the risks? You know, in my house, I have the risk of someone breaking in and stealing something. I guess the same at my work. How about vulnerabilities? What are some of the vulnerabilities? Okay. Obviously, we're all connected to the Internet. That's a vulnerability. We have, you know, campus-wide wireless that's unsecured, so that's a vulnerability. So just lots of different concepts there. Okay. Here we have our threat. We have our agent. Just all kinds of examples. Okay. There's our vulnerability. It could be a buffer overflow. Our asset could be a customer database, and the tactic could be someone trying to break into it. Okay. So the computer could be the subject of an attack or the object. Maybe I'm using the computer to break into the network, or maybe I'm breaking into the network to get to the computer. That's the difference in it. Okay. Real basic stuff. Okay. So this is the value of information comes from the characteristics it possesses. First of all, availability is a big one. You know, if information is out there, you know, can you imagine if uh, maybe I'm an insurance broker, okay, and I'm trying to sell an insurance policy. I need to be able to look up rates. So what happens if I can't look up rates? Well, obviously, they're not available to me. I can't do my job. I can't sell my policy because I don't know what the rates would be. Accuracy would be nice if I knew what the correct rates were. Authentic. How do I know that website I'm connected to to verify my rates is actually the correct website? Has it been manipulated? Has you know, has the unauthorized party accessed it? Have they changed it? What's the integrity of it? What's the utility of it? What is the value of that data to me or to somebody else? And possession, U.S. position of it. What do we see on the news? The the OPM, the Target heist, all these different things. The IRS today. Now they have possession of my user data, or not my user data, my, my um, whatever you call it, my uh, identity, my social security number. I mean, they this year went to file my taxes. Somebody had already filed taxes in my name. Scary stuff. Okay. CNSS. Now, CNSS is a certificate we offer at Rose State. It's a federal certificate, but it is going away, just so you know. It is being replaced, but it is going away. Okay. Here we have an example of confidentiality and integrity availability along with storage, processing, and transmission. They all work together, and that's in conjunction with them would be our policies, our education, our technology. Okay, Just different ways of looking at it. Okay. All right, some of the components of our system. We've got software. That could be our operating system. That could be our work processor. It could be our email program. Our hardware could be the actual physical machine. It could be the server. Maybe I'm running a virtual machine or something like that. Our data, that could be my spreadsheets, my actual data, or it could be my grades. People could be the users. could be me. could be you. could be the people actually using the data. Procedures. There, we have procedures in place to change grades, for example. Wouldn't it be nice if just anybody could go in and randomly change grades? No, we have a procedure in place for that. How about our network? How are these devices all connected together? That's what a network is. Okay. All right, now here this is balancing information security and access. You know, if we make it too easy to get to stuff, then maybe someone's going to break in and steal our stuff. But if we make it too difficult, then people will do it. If you look at the second bullet, it says security should be considered a balance between protection and availability. we got to make it available, but we also need to protect and make sure it's secure. Okay? It says the level of security must all or allow reasonable access, yet protect it. Make sure it's so it's secured but we need to be able to use it as well. Okay, they have what's called the bottom approach. You know, it says the administrators attempt to improve security on their systems. Okay, that's good. We have the technical expertise of the individual administrators, but what, you know, how long have you been doing this job? What is your expertise level? Okay. Normally, it says seldom works as it lacks a number of critical features. Participants support. So that's basically when we're saying that people 
out in the field or trying to get stuff done. Not normally a good idea because you don't have the management behind it. Okay. Now we have something better. Now we have what's called the top-down approach. Okay. Now we have the upper mission. Now we have, rather than the network administrator trying to secure the network, we have the president saying, you know what, we need to get this done. I'm going to give you the budget. I'm going to give you the personnel. You know, telling them what to do. So now we have our policies, our procedures, our processes, our goals. We have support from upper management. Okay. Now the last bullet there says the most successful type is known as the systems development life cycle. Okay. And uh, and actually they talk about a couple more slides here, but with the top down, and yeah, that's the CEO telling the CFO and the CIO what to do, and they're going down the system. Can you imagine if the security technician decided to do it on his own with no support from anybody? How far would that get? Okay. All right. So here's the systems development life cycle. It says the methodology for the design and implementation of an information system. Okay. It's a formal approach to solving a problem based on the structure sequence of procedures. Don't you love it when I just read slides? It's an idea. It's a way of doing things. It's, to, you know, it's a proven technique. Okay, it ensures a rigorous process with a clearly defined goal. The, people have been doing this for years. They know how it works, and we know what we want to get at the end, so we follow it. Now we're going to see the six stages. We have investigation. What do we need to do? Okay, now we know what we need to do. So now we analyze it. We come up with a logical design. Okay, here's what we want it to do. But now we actually have to take that logical design and actually implement it in a physical. Okay, here's an example. Rose State just implemented a brand new fiber optic network. Logical design might be we want to connect all buildings with fiber optic cable. Physical, okay, now we're going to cut across this parking lot. We're going to go under this tree. We're going to cut a hole in this wall. So we actually come into the actual design of it. So now we know what to implement. Okay. Now that we have our physical design, now we actually got to do it. Our entire school is under construction right now. Can you imagine if they were redesigning our library and didn't make a blueprint, didn't make a plan, didn't have a logical design, then incorporate that into an actual blueprint, and then give the blueprint to the construction team? And then we have maintenance and change. Now just because our school is being remodeled right now in 2015, does that mean we're never going to remodel again? Heck no, we're going to remodel all the time. All right. Investigation. What problem is this being developed to solve? Why are we doing this? We have a firewall at our school. Why? Is it there because it's pretty? No, it's there to solve a problem. It's there to protect our network. Okay. We have objectives. We have constraints. We have scopes of projects. So there's just a lot that's involved in the investigation phase. You know, what do you need to get done? Okay. The preliminary cost benefit. So do we want to spend a million dollars on this project or how much less? What's it going to be worth to us? Okay. All right. So here's our analysis. Again, this is the stuff we were talking about here. Okay. Now under analysis, okay, since we've got the organization, we have the current systems in place. So what was our library? What was our learning resource center before? What do we currently have and what do we want to go to? Okay. It says analysts determine what new systems is expected to do and how they interact with existing systems. They are remodeling our library. It's pretty much torn down, but not totally. So how is the old structure going to be incorporated with the new building and the new library? Okay. Analysis ends with documentation of findings and an update of feasibility. Okay, here's what I think we can do. Here's how, you know, that's our document showing that. Then we're going to start a logical design. It says the first and driving factor is the business scene. Why did we upgrade the fiber optics on Rose State? What was wrong with the old one? Well, it sucked. We had no redundancy. Some of our buildings weren't even connected. So obviously it had to be redone. Okay. Specific technologies are delineated to implement a physical switch. So we know we're going to run fiber optic to fix our connectivity between buildings. So that is our specific technology. Okay. Feasibility analysis. Okay, we had to cut across parking lots with that fiber optic cable. Could it be done? Yes, it could be done. Okay, that's what a logical design is. Now, physical design. Okay, now we take those technologies and now we actually come up with the blueprints to do it. 
Okay. So specific technologies are selected to support the alternatives identified in the logical design. So, okay, so we wanted to connect the new dormitories to every other building. We know we want to do with a fiber optic cable to solve our problem of connectivity issues. But how do we actually do it? Okay. What park lot are we going to call? Can we do it? Is it going to work? Okay. Then once they come up a plan on what we're going to do and the cost factor involved, now we need to go to the management and get approval of it. Okay. Now we do it. The software is created, the maintenance is done, the fiber optic cable is ran, okay. parts are ordered, received, tested, stuff is put in, users are trained, it's configured, everything's documented, and then we start the feasibility analysis. Okay. Here you go, is it doing what you want it? As of today, it's not done yet. Okay. Maintenance and chase, that, that first bullet is kind of important. This is the longest and most expensive phase. Think about uh, Windows 7, for instance. We've been using it for many years. So the amount of updates to Windows 7 is probably more than the actual software. So maintenance and changes, are you going to update it? Our buildings you know, were being remodeled. When they were originally put in, did we ever plan on fiber optic cabling? No, we're modifying them, we're changing them right now. When current systems could no longer support the mission, a new project is implemented. Our current connectivity system sucked. So what we did is go for the new project to implement a new one. Will this work forever? Probably not. Okay. Now the security systems development life cycle. So it's the same phase as the other one. Okay. But now we're talking about security threats. Okay. Say so a coherent program rather than a set of random steps. And we're going to see it. We've got the investigation. We've got our processes, our goals, pretty much similar to the other one. But now we're actually talking with policies based on security. Okay. It says feasibility analysis performed at this level. Now we have our analysis again. We have the results from our uh, investigation. It says preliminary analysis of existing policies. What do we have in place? Do they need to be modified? You know, a prime example is we have a computer usage policy on campus. Now we have a dormitory with people living there. Is the computer usage policy sufficient for the new dormitory residents? I don't know. It's not for me to decide. Okay. Uh, legal issues? I mean, the law always plays catch up, but do we need, is that part of the picture here? Risk management. You know, we got people living on our campus 24 7 now. Does that bring in new risks? Obviously, it does. Okay. The logical design? Examine the policies, examine the security. Now, we're, you know, we're, we're still talking about design, but how does it work with the security in mind? Okay. The physical aspect of it? It says, evaluates information security technology needed to support the blueprint. So we have our blueprint of our fiber optic cable. Okay. So how are we going to operate, uh, incorporate security into that? Well, we've got these little manhole covers all over campus. Are those secured? Are they locked? I don't know. I would hope they are. Okay. Uh, we have a new, um, in the new business building, we have a new sprinkler system installed with a little control room for it in the faculty lounge. Is that going to be locked? It would suck if someone just went and randomly turned down water. Hopefully that's been addressed in their plan as well. Implement these controls. Maybe we're going to come out with a new firewall system, new virus scanner system, or new whatever. We are coming out with new door locks. Entire campus is switching a new, uh, basically it's going to be like a you know chip on your student ID is what's going to happen. Okay. Right. Then maintenance, as with everything else, it continues to go forever. Okay. Information security platform or organization requires constant adaptation to new threats. Trust me, tomorrow there's going to be something we didn't know about today. Okay. Now we have the software assurance. Okay. I used to work in the software development flight. What that means is we had to develop software for the military. We had to do it a correct way. Okay. So it says many organizations recognize the need to include planning of security objectives in the security development life cycle. You know, is it being done correctly? Okay. Is our software being made correctly? Okay. All right. Our common body now, as I mentioned here, the common body of knowledge. Okay. There's a lot of stuff. Are, should we reinvent the wheel? Okay. If you're going to bring in something new to your campus or your organization, wouldn't it be nice to see somebody else have already done it? Okay. Natural disasters, there's all kinds of information already done. 
ethics and laws and governments and design and construction and all that stuff. There's lots of information already out there. And there it goes into a little more depth than that chart. We're not going to cover that one. You can look that one over. Okay. Design principles. These are actually covered in many classes. They're very important. You need to know them. So start now. Economy and mechanism. I'm pretty sure we do cover these. Let me make sure you're... I don't cover them. Okay, economy and mechanism. They do talk about your book. It's got to be easy enough to use. Okay, but not not too easy. Fail safe faults. Think about this. So if I'm in Walmart and they lose power, I sure would hope the doors fail to let me out of the building. You know, automatically when they fail, they let me out. In other words, when they lose power, I can get out. Now, what if I was in a bank? Totally different. They lose power in the bank. Think of Nakatomi Plaza and Die Hard 1. What happened when they cut the final power and unlocked the vault? Okay. What happens? Okay. Complete mediation. Check everything. Okay. Every access should be checked. A uh, prime example is, is the TSA at airports. Everybody gets checked going through there. At least we hope they do. Okay. Open design. We don't want something based on security. If you're in my cryptography class, you're going to learn about DES. Okay. DES was based on secrecy. Not a good plan. Okay. AES was based on open design. Much better encryption algorithm. Okay. Separation of privileges. Should I be... Okay. I ran my own company for years. I was the one who received the money and also paid the bills and took out cash. Is that a good idea? Well, since it was my company, yes. But what if it was not my company? What if it was Rogue State? Totally different story. Okay, least privileges give you what you need to get the job done. Nothing more, nothing less. Okay, least common mechanism. We don't want to use the same controls for every device. For instance, should the same key be used on every single door on the entire campus? No, not a good idea. Psychological acceptability. Do we want? First of all, the controls should not be in place to the point where people are afraid to use them. Okay, that's where we're going there. All right, the NIST approach, NIST 800 well, there's tons of NIST documents out there. It talks all about the uh, security, uh, develop, so, security development life cycle. Okay, it talks about early identification, it talks about awareness of potential, identification of scared, uh, shared procedures and shared services. Okay. Lots of information. It wouldn't hurt to look that document over. You will look at it in other classes as well. Okay. Initiation. Okay. You start talking about some of the activities here. Okay. It says delineation of business requirements in terms of confidentiality and integrity. So we have grades on campus. Who should have the ability to view those grades? Okay. Obviously the student, but what about other people? Okay. Determine of uh, information categorizations, identification of known special handling requirements for transmit, storing, and for creating information. Okay, so we're going to store your grades somewhere. We're going to transmit them between computer systems. Is that going to be SSL encrypted? Or is it going to be done over their text? Prime example. Okay. Privacy. You know, privacy is everywhere. How is that going to be implemented? Okay. Entire. Development and acquisition. Okay, activities involved in this are <clears throat> risk assessment. Keep looking at in, yeah, at the different risks, but there's something in here called the baseline security controls. You know, that's like, okay, I look at my traffic today. That will form a baseline. Then I'll keep watching it over time. Does it go up or down? I can see what, like today, or today's the second day of class. Okay, so... We should have been able to tell by last semester what, you know, we had free food yesterday and also today. So we should have known from last semester how much free food we should have brought for this semester. So we don't order too much or too little, okay? That will be our baseline. Same with security, okay? Analyze the requirements. Uh, perform testing. Do you test your updates before you put them out, okay? Documentation. Everybody hates documentation. That is very important, okay? and design your architecture, okay? We're getting close. Implementation here. It says system is installed and evaluated in an operational environment. Does it work? We are getting ready to roll out new wireless all around campus. Hopefully it's tested and they make sure it actually works, okay? 
involves integration of the information system. We actually switched from an older reflection system into a new PeopleSoft system, or current PeopleSoft system. Obviously, that was tested, and then it was integrated. Okay. This is planning and conducting system configuration activities and synchronizations with testing. You're always testing, you're always working on it, and they're always updating. Okay. There we go. Operations and maintenance. It says systems are in place and operational. Enhancements or modifications systems are developed and tested. Hardware and software are added or replaced. Now we make sure things are working. Okay. We're managing the configuration. We're installing the, you know, uh, basically the process is there. Training people how to use the new system. Making sure it's correct. Make sure the security is in place. Okay. <clears throat> Disposal. What do you do when you're done with stuff? Do you uh, throw it on the street corner? Uh, the MIT did a study. Where they bought a bunch of computers off eBay. It's pretty amazing on all the stuff they found. Okay. So it says, building and executing disposal or transition plan. What do you do with your old computers? Do you take the drives out? There's a video on Google you can watch about how Google gets rid of drives. They actually shred them. It's pretty cool. Okay. Archival of critical information. Do you keep a copy of a grade somewhere? Finally, this year, we no longer print out a copy of our grades. First time ever. Sanitation. Is the media deleted? Is it formatted? Is it cleaned? Is it whatever? Then what do you do with your computers? As I already mentioned. All right, and there's Microsoft System Development Lifecycle. Okay, we're not going to go into that one as well. Okay, security professionals. There's lots of professionals out there, okay? And we're going to talk about a couple of them. First of all, we've got our CIO, Chief Information Officer. That should be the head guy here, okay? We have our Chief Information Security Officer, okay? Reports directly to the CIO, manages more of the security aspect of it, okay? The project team. Whenever you have a security project team, you need something in charge. We have a team leader. We have the policy developers. We have the specialists. Now, does that mean we really need, do we really need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people for every project? No. You could have one person handling many of these roles. Or you might have multiple people doing it. But those are just some of the different positions that people would hold. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Communities of interest, there's a lot of places out there where a bunch of people would get together and actually they talk about them here in a second. All right. So, like it says there, is it an art or a science? Okay. Security artesian issues is ideas based on the way individuals perceive uh, system technologists and their abilities, and they're not showing it. Okay. Well, we're going to get there in a minute. Okay. So, as an art, there's no hard and fast roles nor Many universally accepted complete solutions. So, for security, can I go on Google and find the best security policy in the world? Is it going to work for everybody? No, there's no way. There's no set plan that will work for everybody. Okay. There's no manual for all this stuff. So you need to figure out as you go. All right. Now, as a science, now we can work with technology. We can look at different performance levels. We can look at our baselines. We can see how everything works together. It says almost every fault security or system malfunction results of interaction of specific hardware and software. So in other words, systems themselves. All right. As a social science, by the way, I'm not a social science major. It examines the behaviors of individuals interacting with the system. That I would think this is more along the lines of are the people main, you know, maintaining with policies? Are they interacting correctly? Is it Friendly, okay? So security be begins and ends with people that interact with the system, intentionally or otherwise. That could be the end users. It could be people trying to break in the system. Pretty much anything. All right, well, this was the end of the first chapter, okay? It's um, not too much in depth. Just touches on lots of different areas. Many of these things are going to be touched on again in another chapter. So don't freak out if some of this stuff was, oh, I don't know. Tough. All right. So, yeah, this is all, you know, for the most part covered again in other chapters. But it just gives you an idea of where we're at. All right. I got to figure out how to stop this.